Let me introduce Dr. Judy Crabtree. Okay, so please welcome Dr. Judy Crabtree. Dr. Crabtree received her PhD training in biochemistry and genetics from the University of Oklahoma in one of the original labs that was funded to sequence the human genome. She did her postdoctoral work at the National Human Genome Research Institute at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, under the direction of Dr. Francis Collins, studying the biology of an endocrine tumor disease called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. From there, she entered the world of pharmaceutical drug development at Wyeth Pharmaceuticals. In 2009, she left the pharmaceutical industry and joined LSU HSC as an assistant professor of genetics. She is currently an associate professor of genetics and the scientific and education director of the precision medicine program at LSU HSC. More recently in the pandemic, she implemented the COVID testing program for the LSU HSC campus and has launched the viral sequencing efforts to track COVID variants of concern in Southern Louisiana. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Judy Crabtree. Thank you, Laura. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Get me set up. Oh, come on. Okay, so thank you for this opportunity. I mean, this has just been a great meeting the past two days. We've seen so many great talks and posters. I'm very excited. And so um, what's interesting though, is as I was preparing this talk, um, I realized that today is 25 years to the day since I started my postdoc. And so I had just finished uh, my PhD work under the direct direction of Dr. Bruce Rowe at the University of Oklahoma, where we were sequencing regions of human chromosome 22 as part of the Human Genome Project. And on April 1st, 1997, I began my postdoctoral study at the NIH under the direction of Dr. Francis Collins. Now I can tell you, if you've never started a new job on April Fool's Day, it is quite the experience. <laughs> And so as the new green postdoc, I was immediately the April Fool and the easy target of many practical jokes in my new lab. But what I didn't realize at that point was that this was the beginning of a translational career built on genomics and its application to human health. And so I was fortunate to not only contribute sequencing data to the Human Genome Project, but to also be in the epicenter of human genomic research in the US upon completion of the Human Genome Reference Sequence in 2003. So at that time, I was infused with optimism about what we could do to understand human health and disease, how we could further understand what makes each of us alike, but also what makes each of us different. So how are we different in our responses to environmental stimuli, to pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drugs, to chemotherapy? And since this day in 1997, I've studied cancer and performed large-scale transcriptomic analyses, um, of several tumor and cancer syndromes. I've worked in the drug development and pharmaceutical industry. And then now here we are 25 years later, I'm translating what I've learned in each of these varied research environments to supporting patient management in our CAP accredited clinical precision medicine laboratory. Now, in order to understand the current state of affairs with respect to precision medicine, we kind of need to start at the beginning. So I hope this isn't repetitive to some people, um, but it's always fun to look at history. So uh, in the late 1980s, a group of scientific thought leaders that included Francis Collins of the NIH, Ari Petrinos from the US Department of Energy, Eric Lander from the Broad Institute at MIT and several others, they sat down over a pint of lager and outlined on the back of cocktail napkins, a plan for mapping and sequencing the complete human genome. So this project launched um, in 1990 and ultimately took 13 years to complete at a cost of about $2.7 billion. And so here you can see the publications, the cover of the public effort in nature and the competing private effort in science. Now, the key thing that I want you to remember is that the human genome reference sequence is not the genome of one individual. It's a compilation from the 20 anonymous individuals, mostly anonymous. Further, the 20 individuals were selected from a pool of over 1,000 donors whose information was ultimately de-identified so that even those who contributed do not know if their DNA was used or not. And so this was done intentionally by the architects of the Human Genome Project to ensure that no single person's genome was exclusively represented 
presented, and also so that no individual could be identified by their contribution to the reference genome. Now, once the reference genome was complete, this opened up a huge number of questions about the genetic diversity of humans. And so one of the astonishing facts from the Human Genome Project was that single nucleotide variants occur approximately one every 300 nucleotides. So if you do the math, that means there are roughly 10 million single nucleotide variants in the human genome. And these variations are one contributing factor to the genetic diversity in humans. And so this opened up a whole new set of questions. So what is the intersection between disease and genetic variants? What's the relationship between drug metabolism and genetic variation? Is there a cancer genome? And does that cancer genome change over time and in, in between the, the primary tumor and a metastasis or a recurrence? Um, how does the genome impact mental health, behavioral health? Um, it had already been observed that some diseases were more prevalent in certain populations. And so then questions about what's the role of genetic variation in ethnicity. And so over the years that followed the completion of the human genome reference sequence, it became more and more clear that we knew too little. The genomic community as a whole began a sort of haphazard way um, collecting information we needed to answer some of the questions about genetic variability. But as time went on, the cost of whole, and, 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 and as time went on, the cost of whole genome sequencing um, decreased. So now it's approaching $1,000 with a turnaround time of seven to 10 days. And so, so now the big picture idea was that if we can perform genomic testing um, at an acceptable cost, get private insurance and Medicaid, Medicare buy-in to perform genomic testing in the clinical setting, we can use this as evidence-based medicine to identify the best therapeutic and preventative interventions to best benefit our patients. And so to set this up in a more organized fashion, um, we, we realized that there was a need for a more concerted effort to understand genomic variation. So the NIH announced its support of precision medicine in 2015 when then President Obama in his State of the Union address described precision medicine as an emerging approach to disease prevention and treatment that takes into account people's individual variations in genes, environment, and lifestyle. So this was accompanied by a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine written by then director of the NIH, Francis Collins, and past director of the National Cancer Institute, Harold Barmas. Um, this perspective further supported the convictions of President Obama that science offers great potential for improving human health. And this officially launched the NIH Precision Medicine Initiative in 2015. Now, a key part of the Precision Medicine Initiative is the All of Us Research Program. Um, this was launched officially about four years ago, and this is a cornerstone of the Precision Medicine Initiative that seeks to enroll one million or more participants that represent the broad diversity of the United States so that we can understand variants much better than we do. So patients will complete surveys, provide biological specimens for whole genome sequencing, and then grant access if they choose to their medical records for de-identified population-based studies that correlate genetics and genetic variants with disease and environmental factors such as where you live. Now, the All of Us Network is composed of national partners and regional medical centers across the U.S. to enroll participants from all walks of life and all states of health within the United States. So just this month, the All of Us Research Program hit a key milestone and released the first set of nearly 100,000 whole genome sequences. More than half of this new genomic information comes from people who self-identify with racial or ethnic minority groups. And that's extremely important because until now, more than 90% of participants in the large genomic studies were all of European descent. And so this lack of diversity has had huge impacts. It deepens the health disparities and hinders scientific discovery from fully benefiting everyone. So I do wanna point out that LSU HSC is a flagship institution in the Southern region of the All of Us program. We affectionately call this program the Y'all of Us Network for those of you who know about the Southern dialect. Um, and this is in collaboration with Tulane University, the University of Mississippi Medical Center, University of Alabama, Birmingham, and, and other major institutions across the Gulf South. So this is the website where you can learn more information about the All of Us program. And there's still time to join either through the website down here or the app, which looks like this blue banner up in the upper left corner. Um, once you've registered, you can then make an appointment to donate your sample for sequencing um, at one of our participating clinics. So all of this is going to contribute to our understanding of the human genome and how genetic variants can impact our health. 
And so what I'd like to do now is share a study with you that was one of the first studies to come out in um, PLOS Genetics in 2011 to show you the predictive ability of precision medicine. And so this study used next generation sequencing to evaluate human health in a predictive way. Um, and in this study, the authors performed whole genome sequencing of four members of a family, mom, dad, daughter, and son. And as an aside, uh, the family used in this study is the West family. And if you look at the author list carefully, you can see John West and Ann West are both authors on this study. So John West was the CEO of Selexa at the time. So this is the company that developed the current next generation sequencing technology that was then sold to Illumina and is now the foundation for their current almost market cornering technology for next generation sequencing. And so this is the pedigree for the West family. If you aren't used to reading pedigrees, um, the squares are males, the circles are females. Um, horizontal lines indicate either a marriage or siblings. Um, and diagonal lines across the symbol indicate that the individual is deceased. Now the arrows indicate the four immediate family members of the West family. So we have John, his wife, the daughter, Anne, and her brother. And note the multi-generational history of cardiovascular and blood clotting problems within this family. So there are several incidents of myocardial infarction, um, congestive heart failure, deep vein thrombosis, and hypertension. Um, John was ho hospitalized twice with venous thromboembolism in two separate incidents um, during the period of time when he and his doctor were working out the appropriate anticoagulant for him to be taking for his condition. So the whole genome sequencing of this family identified, among other things, um, multiple variants in genes related to blood clotting. So this process utilized two carefully curated databases, Veramed, which correlates genetic variants associated with disease, and PharmGKB, which catalogs genetic variants associated with drug responses. Now, there are many such databases available now. These were just the first two that were established at the time of the study back in 2011. Now, a blinded, um, in a bi blinded bioinformatics analysis of these data, um, the investigators were able to correctly predict the type and the dose of the anticoagulant that John was already taking. So he and his doctor had settled on clopidogrel after an extensive period of trial and error to get the dose and, and drug um, correct for one that worked for him. Now, imagine if John had been screened for known variants before he even took any medication. Well, that's essentially what happened for his daughter. So the study predicted what medication she may need in the future based on her genetic profile. And interestingly, the medication is different from that her dad is taking, mostly because remember, everybody inherits two alleles and inherited one risk allele from her father and a different risk allele from her mother. So Anne was 17 at the time of the study, and now she's 29 years old and has no health problems as of yet because she was able to implement some simple lifestyle changes and increase her surveillance to help mitigate her risk for cardiovascular complications. So this is just one example of how genomics can impact human health and disease risk assessment. The second example is within oncology. So the field of oncology is leading the way in precision medicine and targeted therapies um, because the identification of variants as biomarkers or targets of disease has led to new targeted therapies for patients with cancer. Now, past treatments um, have all been focused on tissue-specific mechanisms or systemic therapies. So for example, the traditional chemotherapies such as microtubule inhibitors, platinum therapies, and cyclophosphamides these are all cytotoxic drugs that kill all rapidly dividing cells. And so there are also other cancers such as hormone responsive breast cancer or prostate cancers uh, that have obvious hormone dependence. So the first line of therapy in these tumors is a systemic hormone deprivation. And the problem with all of these systemic based chemotherapies is that they often have some really miserable side effects for the patient. And so more recent focus has been on variants and the targeted therapies. And as time has gone by, and we learned more and more about the molecular basis of cancers. And so shown here is non-small cell lung cancer and melanoma. And we know that each of, these com each of these common cancers is actually a collection of more rare cancers. So for example, many cancers or many variants have been detected in non-small cell lung cancer, including driver mutations in the genes for uh, things like EGFR, BRAF, MEK1, AKT, and P10. Um, and then within, within each of these um, driver mutations, 
there's individual variants that add further complexity. So for example, within the EGFR mutations in non-small cell lung cancer, there are at least seven known individual variants. And in melanoma, it's similar. The common driver mutations are in the BRAF gene, um, and these include six individual variants. So imagine if we had drugs that were specific for each of these individual variants, and how cool would that be, right? Well, and that's where we are, albeit in the very, very early stages. Um, right now, the majority of the drugs that are seeking and receiving FDA approval in oncology are targeted therapies that are designed to hit specific molecular targets that are defined by a genomic variant. So these new drugs interrupt cancer cell proliferation, but in theory, they leave other non-cancer cells more intact with the goal of less intense side effects for the patient. There are also new immunotherapies that capitalize on the patient's own immune system to fight types of cancer with specific genetic signatures. And so now the challenge is, can we identify all the variants that impact disease and develop therapies that work best for each of those different disease-causing variants? So the All of Us Research Program will help with that in the U.S., and similar programs are in place in other countries. And we also have to start to convince Big Pharma to change their strategy and begin to develop targeted therapies for newly identified variants instead of seeking that next billion-dollar blockbuster drug. Now, in the clinical setting, we identify DNA variants in a variety of ways. Um, we can look we can use uh, single gene sequencing analysis to look for germline mutations in particular genes, such as BRCA1 or 2. Um, we can do screenings for variants in the genes that are uh, metabolic enzymes, such as the cytochrome P450 enzymes that are responsible for drug metabolism in the liver. And we can perform gene panels, such as Oncotype DX or Mammaprint, uh, that contain smaller number of genes to identify variants and predict tumor recurrence um, in some particular tumor types. Or we can do what we're doing at the LSUHSC Clinical Precision Medicine Laboratory, which is focus on the next generation sequencing based approaches. So this includes TSO 500, whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. So our initial approach for TSO 500 uh, will, will support solid tumors, and then we'll expand into hematological malignancies and then we'll implement hereditary cancer screening, risk identification, and some non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT, um, all of which runs on the same next-generation sequencing platform. And so this testing is one of the pillars of support for our future bid for NCI Cancer Center designation in the region. And so this is the instrument we have from Illumina called the NextSeq 550DX. This instrument is currently in use for genomic sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 for COVID-19, um, but we will be pivoting soon to run TSO 500, which is a panel that contains 523 oncology-related genes. And you can see some of those listed here, along with the different types of cancer with which they are affiliated. Uh, this panel also provides an assessment of microsatellite instability and defects in mismatch repair. Uh, these support the use of checkpoint inhibitor therapies, um, as well as overall tumor mutational burden, which is an indicator of immunotherapy treatment success. So the way it works in our laboratory is we have tests that are ordered by a physician. Um, our pathology partners uh, review the sample and submit the tumor and normal samples for sequencing. In the lab, we process those samples, perform library generation, and put them on the sequencer. And then the large amounts of raw data that result from the NextSeq are run through quality assurance, quality control, and base calling algorithms to convert those raw image data files into a text file format. You guys have already heard about FastQ. Um, and there are also the associated uh, FRED quality scores that are associated with each base. And then following this base calling, the sequencing reads are aligned with the reference genome and resulting in a BAM file. Uh, MAP sequences are then used uh, to identify variants and result in a variant call format or a BCF. So we partner with Perian DX for this service and their algorithms identify and prioritize single nucleotide variants based on multiple criteria. Uh, these include variant allele frequency, strand bias, sequencing depth in the gene region, quality scores, et cetera, as well as it draws from their extensive database of patient outcomes from other NCI designated cancer centers nationwide to recommend treatment strategies. So the identified variants are annotated um, as to the gene and location, that's the ABCF file. And then they're often manually curated to ensure accuracy, quality, and adherence to the current nomenclature and naming conventions. 
So all of this data is distilled into a report that's integrated into the EMR, the electronic medical record, and it's made available for tumor board review and for clinical decision making. So those sample reports look like this. So it has patient information at the top, and then it has a listing of the variants that are identified in the analyzed sample. So there's also information about the responsiveness of this tumor with, or a tumor with this profile to certain drugs. And you can see that here in the middle, um, as well as the opportunities for clinical trials that are associated with this type of variant. And so we can set the distance parameters to limit available clinical trials to within so many miles of the patient, um, mostly for convenience sake. And then down here at the bottom, you can see the results for tumor mutational burden, which is really the emerging um, marker associated with greater sensitivity of a tumor to immunotherapies, and also microstatolite instability status, which when high, this, this example is low, but when it's high, it predicts sensitivity to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So all of this leads us to the precision medicine ideal of delivering the right drug to the right patient at the right time. And so right now we're sort of in this top level here where we have patients receiving a drug um, and then there's a small proportion of those patients who actually respond. Um, what we'd like to do is get to this stage at the bottom where we have a different drug for different um, genetic variants that are available within the oncology and, and other space. This doesn't necessarily have to be only oncology driven, um, even though oncology is leading the way. Um, but this is where we want to go, where we get the right drug and the right patient at the right time. And so with that, I'll, I'd like to thank you for your attention and this opportunity, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Crabtree. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Okay. We have a few questions for you. Uh, the first one is, how much data is being generated by your lab at um, LSU HSC? So <laughs> is it just genomic data or is an SMP data, or do they also generate other types of data? So right now, the only data being generated in our laboratory is um, viral sequences for SARS-CoV-2. Um, we are not currently running uh, the TSO 500. We are not currently doing whole genome or whole exome sequencing. That is our next, the next endeavor, um, mostly just because we kind of got derailed to do sequencing for SARS-CoV-2 and we have yet to pivot. That makes sense. Okay, our next question is, how many people are you planning to get sequence data from in the state of Louisiana and also just in the South in general? Sequence data for um, whole genome, whole exome? Or is this yes. the question of how many samples are we gonna run? How many samples are you going to run? Okay, so once TSO is up and running, so this, the instrument that we have is a moderate throughput um, instrument. There's one bigger that we do not yet have, but we can always buy if we end up having more samples to process. Um, our laboratory is not going to only support LSU. It's going to support the entire region. And so at the moment, we have the capacity in our current instrument to run um, eight tumors normal pairs per week. Um, but then, you know, as, as need and demand increases, we can always scale that up. Got it. Uh, and then one final question, what originally inspired you to become involved in genomics? <laughs> so this is kind of a cool study. So, or a cool a story. So I, uh, I had a science teacher named Jim Martin, and he would die if he knew I was telling the story. Back when I was in high school, we were in basic biology, and he gave each of us a laminated piece of paper that had either a circle on the end or a triangle on the end. And some of us had the points and some of us had the correlating V. Right. And so essentially what he handed out to the whole class was nucleotides and he lined us up in the hallway and some of us were the parental strand and then others of us came in and formed the replicating strand. 
And so that was really my first introduction to, <laughs> to DNA and, and anything having to do with DNA sequencing. And so he taught us DNA replication in the hallway of the high school. And, and so that was really, you know, that was many, many years ago, but um, that was really my first introduction to, to DNA. And it's kind of stuck ever since then gene therapy, you know, I'm, I've got a huge interest in not only DNA sequencing and genomics, but, but into, you know, gene therapy and that translation of what we can learn from genomics to patient care. Great. That is a fun story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> he would die. So we have... <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Well, that was again, a great talk by Dr. Trubel.